All right, we're going to be talking about radicals. A radical. A radical looks like this. It means root, it's Latin for root. That's a radical. Okay, I should put that in the notes. Down here, this is what we talked about briefly yesterday, and we'll go over it again for people who might not be here. But this sign right here, generally speaking, is called a radical. And it's a root. Well, no, that looks like I'm going to make a T. This is an L. Maybe it's a good idea to make an L that way. Out here you have a little number called the index. And inside in here, you have stuff. You have an algebra expression or you have a number. And this is called the radicand. And as we were talking about yesterday, there are two ways to write any root. First is the big secret that the square root does have an index. It has index two. So that the square root of five, I just picked that number out of the air. The square root of five can also be written as five to the one half power. They are exactly equal. The third root or the cube root of five can be written as five to the one third. And let's do the fourth root of five, but it's going to be same for all indexes, which is really called indices. When, when you have more than one index, it's referred to as indices. That's the plural, the plural. This is the one fourth root. OK, so they're just equivalent ways of writing the same thing. But this is more convenient for some things. And we're going to look at that right now, for instance. Um, OK, yes, turn it on. We have to turn it on. I've already graphed y equals the square root of x, but I'm going to do it again. Now, right now I'm not on the new operating system, so I go second x squared, and that gives me my radical. Notice there's a little box on the inside there where I can write my radicand. So I could write X and that's very graphable. And then I hit graph and that's what the square root of X looks like. Okay, I can also write this as X carrot one divided by two, x to the one half power. Now I'm going to graph that. You don't see it because they're exactly the same graph. So one is on top of the other. If you saw any little difference between them, that would mean they're not exactly equal, but they are exactly equal. Now let me do all of this business with the older operating system. So I'm going to clear 
and I'm going to clear. And I'm going to go to mode. Yes, that's right. Right here is math print. That's typing with the new newer operating system, but I can go back to classic, the original operating system and hit enter. And then I have the operating system a lot of you have. Some of you have the newer, some of you have the older, the classic, we don't say older, we say classic. I am classic. Sounds weird, like a car. Mm. Okay, now here is how the people with um, the older operating system would type, would type their stuff. All right, second X squared, same thing. But now look, you have a, um, a radical sign and then you have a parenthesis. Now in the parenthesis, I type X and whenever I have an open parenthesis, I have to close it. Above the nine is where you close your parentheses. And then I graph. Same exact graph. Now I'm going to come down here and type X to the one half power. So X caret, you can actually see the caret symbol there. Then since I'm going to make a fraction, I use parentheses to group the two numbers together. One divided by two and close the parentheses. And again, you don't see the graph because they're one on top of the other. But the value of the older system is that you actually see what you type. And that can be very valuable. But actually, they're just two separate ways of doing the same thing. OK, clear and clear. Now I want to graph the cube root. And to do that, we have to click on the math key. And look at number four here. This is the cube root. So I'm going to, actually I could just type four or I can move the cursor down to four and then hit enter. There I have the cube root. Well, I could have put it up there, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to type X and I'm going to close my parentheses. Here is what the cube root looks like. Okay, it goes. I like it. Okay. I can also type X to the one third power. So I'll do it up here. X caret parenthesis. When I write, when I type a fraction, I have to put parenthesis, parentheses. One divided by three. That's X to the one third power. Your, those um, da vertical dash signs moving up is the calculator thinking. Now it's thinking, why is this stupid human doing exactly the same thing two ways? Because I'm a stupid human. Also because this is exactly the same graph because these two statements are exactly the same thing. They would give you exactly the same number. OK, now.
typing the fourth root is a little trickier. I'm going to go to the new system and then to the old system. To type the fourth root, fifth root, sixth root, seventh root, eighth root, you have to hit math. And then five for the x root of whatever. Because from here on out, after the cube root, you don't have a function that says cube root. You have to make your own. Um, and so you, this is the way you have to do it. Like I said, it can be a little tricky. Thank goodness we're recording. Uh, where was I? Y equals, okay. All right, here I go. I know that I wanna graph the fourth root for you. The fourth root of X, let me write it. Here's how I have to do it in the calculator. I have to go to the, no, I have to go to the math key, math. And then I have to either go down to five or just click the number five. In the newer system, this is what you see. Let me move the cursor over so you can see this. You have a box for the index and a box for the radicand. It all makes perfect sense. So since I want this to be the fourth root, I'll type a four in there, and then I'll, I'll take the right, right arrow key and move it to underneath the radical and type X, and then move the cursor to outside the radical, and this is what I'm going to graph. It looks almost like y equals x squared. I mean, no, it doesn't. It looks almost like the square root of x. They look alike. They're similar. And here's the secret. The sixth root of x, the eighth root of x, and so on. If the index is an even number, the graphs are going to all look pretty much alike. Only they keep getting flatter and flatter. All right, so anyway, this is not a great graph but it's a general graph of the fourth root of X. Now, it's a lot less trouble to type X caret to the one fourth. Okay. Same exact graph. Because they're exactly the same. The fourth root of X is exactly the same thing as X to the one fourth power. Just a different way of writing it, but that way comes in handy sometimes. For instance, it's much quicker to graph this with either operating system than it is to graph this with the newer or the older, but especially with the older. I am now going to clear this and go down to the older operating system. OK. 
Okay. If I want to type the fourth root of X, I have to type a four. Then I push the math key. Yes, then I push five. Or I go down to five. Either way, and hit enter. And then I type X. For one, for one term, I do not need parentheses, I don't think. Let's see, maybe I do. Nope, I don't. Not when it's just one term under the radical, although it's much safer to do that. Hello, George. No, mm -hmm. I know it's hard being a kitty cat. OK. So I just thought I would mention that. You can play around with this. You can watch the videos. And kind of get the idea. OK, George. OK, there you go. Now we can do math. All right, let me get rid of this. And ooh, we will go on. OK, now where was I? Let's go back here. So here are radicals, they're square roots. And they actually have an algebraic expression underneath. In fact, this is a, a, a radical function. F of X equals the square root of 2X minus 1. 2X minus 1 is all underneath the radical. I need to find the domain. That's what we're being asked to do. Hello, George. Here we go. There is a method to finding the domain of a square root function, or a fourth root, or a sixth root, or an x, or an eighth root, any, any even root. So this is true, true for any, yes, my arm is getting hit, for any, I'm not supposed to be paying attention to you, I'm supposed to be paying attention to him, but tough luck. True for any even index radical. Which means root. OK, here, here's how. You start with f of x equals the square root or the fourth root or the sixth root or the eighth root, blah, 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 of 2x minus 1. Then you take the radicand outside and set it greater than or equal to zero. Then you solve this inequality, plus one, plus one. Negative one plus one is zero. So on the left, I have two X greater than or equal to one. Then I divide both sides by two, and I get X is greater than or equal to one half. That is the domain of my function. So look over here. And there we go. 
this is the answer. All X, see they've stopped writing X is a real number. This is just all X such that X is greater than or equal to one half. If you were writing this in interval notation, you would make a bracket at one half and then comma infinity. X is equal to or greater than positive one half. That's the domain. These are the only X's we are allowed to use. Well, what if I didn't? What if I used, I don't know, negative one? What if I used zero? Let's use zero. Because notice that the domain starts at positive one half, which leaves out zero and negative one, whatever. Put that in your calculator, you get an error message, not a real number. This number is not in the real number system. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, as you will find out soon, but it's not in the real number system. Okay. So what does that mean? That means zero is not in the domain. That's what it means. So zero, this is how you would say it mathematically. Zero is not in the domain. Only numbers bigger than positive one half. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, you're wonderful. Only numbers bigger than positive one half or positive one half itself can be used. Not any number outside that area, that interval of numbers. So let's do this. I start with f of x equals the square root of 4x plus 3. I take out the radicand and set it greater than or equal to 0. And I solve the inequality. I mean, these are real little inequalities. So x is greater than or equal to negative 3 fourths, which is right here, c. Well, that means that the domain runs, includes some negative numbers. How can that be? I'll show you. What matters is that 4x plus 3 is equal to or greater than 0. Not that x is greater than or equal to 0. You can have negative x's as long as they don't make the overall radicand negative. But let's look at the graph of this. Okay, second x squared. Okay, I'm in the old operating system right now, which is just fine, probably even better. 
4x plus 3. 4x plus 3 is underneath the radical, so 4x plus 3 is included in the parentheses. What that says to the calculator is this. Now I'm going to graph it. See the graph starts over here. It's not up in the air, it's just that the graph won't go all the way down to the x-axis. Because it's almost but not quite vertical there, the graph. Um, okay. So sometimes, yes, we do get negative numbers in the domain. What matters is that the radicand is not negative, ever. And then we have this. I'm going to use the same steps. This is just for finding the domain of an even indexed radical, which in this case, they're just doing it for square roots. But like I said before, it could be for fourth roots or sixth roots or eighth roots or 10th roots or 12th root, roots. Any of the index, as long as two goes evenly into the index, that means this is the way we're going to find the domain. X is greater than or equal to eight thirds. That's going to be A this time. Okay. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. It's just so that you know. But you might have a question about, well, what about an odd root? What happens with an odd root? Let's go over to the notes. And take a look. Let's do an odd root. How about the fifth root of X? Ah, oh, there it is. We're going to graph the fifth root of X. So I type a five math five. X. It would be safer, just so much safer to be in the habit of always putting parentheses around it, around your radicand if you have the older operating system. Here's what that looks like. Ultimately cool. If you have odd indices like um, the cube root of X, the fifth root of X, the seventh root of X, the ninth root of X, and so on, the domain is wonderful, negative infinity to positive infinity. You don't even have to worry about the domain. Yep, it's true. All right, let's move on. So here we have some numbers and we're being asked to find the, uh, the answers. 
what is 64 to the one third power? Now, you're going to have to read the instructions. Simplify your answer, type an exact answer using radicals as needed. This is going to be the cube root of 64. Um, which I happen to know is four because I work with it a lot. But just in case you don't know, let's go to the calculator. We're not going to be graphing a lot anymore. Um, we're going to take, actually you can, you can take the cube root of 64 or you can take 64 caret parentheses one divided by three parentheses closed, enter, and it's four. Four times four times four is 64. How about 256 to the three fourths? As long as I've got the calculator out, let's do that. And then I'll show you how to do it by hand. Although in this day and age, there's almost no need to do it by hand. 256 caret parentheses, three divided by four. Not seven. I have an animal attacking me. 64. Let's take a look at it. Notice how I'm going to write this because you're going to have to write it. The fourth root, the index goes at the end of the diagonal line. The fourth root of 256 to the third power. Now there's something you should know and that is that this is the same thing as to the fourth root of 256 to the third power. What this means is you cube 256 first and then you take the fourth root. What this says is you take the fourth root and then you cube. Just so you know that can happen. Of course, the easiest thing to do is to just take 256 to the 3 fourths power in your calculator, but let's take the fourth root of 64. Okay, so we'll have four, math, five, there you go, 64. It's just one number, but again, it's safer if you go paren, 64, close parentheses. <gasps> because it's not that. Ignore that. Teacher didn't make a mistake, just testing you. It's the fourth root of 256. What is the fourth root of 256? We do that first and then cube it. I bet it's four. All right, four. Um, math, five. Parentheses, two, five, six, parentheses closed. It's four. So the fourth root of 256 is four. That means we've got four, and now we're going to cube it So, we're going to take 4 and caret 3. And that's 64. So, either way, either way, we get 64 as an answer. And the, the third root of 64, the cube root, is just 4. Rewrite this with rational 
exponents. That means fraction exponents. This is a square root. There's an invisible two index and 17 is to the invisible one power. So what that gives us is 17 to the one half. Now rewrite this with rational exponents. This is, the index is a six as you can see. And I mean, I hope you can see. Make it all bigger, just to make sure. This is 23 to the one power. So this is going to be 23 to the one over six power. Now going back up here to that three fourths power thing, notice that the four goes to the outside and the three, well, that can either go to the inside or that can do like this. But that's where these come from, these numbers in the fraction exponent. Notes. Now we deal with negative exponents. You can never get away from them. It would be nice if we could. Okay, two times x to the negative one fourth. That's what we have. Remember from yesterday, negative exponents mean that the base x is in the wrong location. Two is not going to be affected by that exponent because there are no parentheses here. So it's just the x being raised to the negative one fourth power. Well, what this is, is you can always take just about anything and put it over one. So since this is in the wrong place up here, it's going to come down to the correct place down here. So this is going to be two over X to the positive one fourth. Now let's see what these say. Type an exponent type exponential notation with positive exponents. Use integers or fractions for any number in the expression. OK, they want you to answer. With positive exponents. So they don't want you to change this back into radical form. This is just to give you some practice working with negative fraction exponents. Ah, write with positive exponent, then simplify. Then simplify means find the answer. So this is actually going to be a stew, a, a stew, a two step problem. First, you're going to be asked. To write this correctly with a positive exponent, then you're going to be asked to find the answer. That is to simplify. So 64. To the negative one half power. Is really 64 to the negative one half power over one which means 64 is written in the wrong place and needs to move down underneath and have a positive exponent. And then a one goes up here. So you can take this now and put it in your calculator. You can take a square root of 64 or you can take 64 to the one half power. You'll find out it's eight. The square root of 64 is 8. So your answer is going to be 1 over 8. And you should have two answer boxes here. You're going to have this. And then the next question will ask you this. Leave it there for a minute for you to look at. 
get a drink of coffee. Okay, let's write this carefully and talk about what it really is. This is four times a to the three fifths power, b to the negative two thirds power, oh, times, times, c to the three halves power. Now it says rewrite using only positive rational exponents. So don't change it to radicals. Well, this is really an expression over one. And it looks to me like this is in the wrong place and needs to come down here because it has a negative exponent where it is. So, our answer is going to be four times a to the three fifths, c to the three halves over b to the two thirds. And that's going to be your answer. These are a lot easier than they could be. You just kind of blurt out any questions you might have. Now, take a look at this. We're starting to get into the rules of exponents, but now we are applying them to rational exponents. I'll write this. Now, this. We're going to do that trick we did yesterday. Okay, negative seven thirds is negative one times positive seven thirds. And I am going to let the negative one power take effect first. Any fraction raised with parentheses raised to the negative one power is flipped and becomes its reciprocal. Okay. Now, be aware that since you don't see any exponents on these guys, there are exponents there. One, 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 one. And what's going to happen here is that the exponents, seven third, seven thirds, is going to multiply each of the exponents in here, so that our answer is going to be two to the seven thirds, y to the seven thirds, z to the seven thirds, over five to the seven thirds, x, to the seven thirds. And that's it, since 
you're being asked to write this with rational exponents. Talk about underlining. It's kind of ugly, isn't it? I prefer that. All right, we write with positive exponents. One over a base with a negative exponent. Again, this is in the wrong place, needs to come upstairs. The exponent changes signs, and of course, anything over one is just itself. Now, here's the tricky part. Can you hear me? I could not understand. Could you try again? Um, um, I just I just see this really. I didn't have this right. Okay, are are you asking? I it you're you're garbled. To me, you you sound garbled. It's okay. It's no, okay. No. What's the next okay. question? Okay, have you uh, do you understand now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm sorry. All right, you have to be aware of what the base is. If there were parentheses around the 2C, then you would have 2C raised to the negative one third power. And then this whole thing would come up there. So you would have 3D times 2C to the positive one third and then you would over one, and then you would have three D two to the one third times C to the one third. That's if you had parentheses, but you don't. The way this problem started out was three D over two C to the negative one third. The two and the C are entirely separate. It's the C that has the negative exponent and so will come up here and have a positive exponent. Three D times C to the one third over two and since we often, in math, put things in alphabetical order. That might be the answer. I don't think it matters, though. They are exactly equivalent answers. It's just that that's prettier because C comes before D. I don't know. You're going to investigate. But you see, how tricky these can be. The difference between having parentheses and not having parentheses is vast. Let's see what you, uh, but we apparently have hit the end. I find that a little difficult to believe. So let me check your homework and make sure. Uh, no, wrong thing.
Um, radical functions, domain and radical exponents, rational exponents rather. All right, let's just jump down to the end and see if I left anything out. No. Well, good gosh golly. So what's coming up on Tuesday, because Monday I'm going to be sitting here and being the answer lady for any questions you've got on problems from the practice exam. Of course, you can all, always contact me, right? We can make a special time to meet together on Teams, or we can meet during my office hours, or you can send me a question through Ask My, Ask My instructor almost said ask my advisor well that's a good idea too um but yeah i want to see what what are we going to be doing yes okay i thought so next week starting tuesday correction starting wednesday so you're not going to have any new work on Monday and Tuesday, so you can study for the exam. And take the exam. And upload your nice, neat scratch work that's numbered to um, the appropriate link in week eight. All right, yeah, we're going to be adding, multiplying and simplifying. And then we're going to Oh, but we're going to be simplifying first. And then we're going to be adding, multiplying, and simplifying in another way. Okay, so this, it's Thursday. This is it. Making sure. It's Thursday, so this is it for this week. You have... The, um, the midterm exam, which actually is really more of a, an exam too. I didn't include very much at all from before. From the last exam, I didn't include much at all, if anything, because there just wasn't room. So, any questions? This is the perfect time. <clears throat> so are you not in your... Um... You know how we can get the bonus points for going to like say hi to you or something like that? Yes. Um, are you not in your office Fridays? No, no, I'm not. Okay. But if that's the only time you can meet, I'll meet you. Uh, yeah, that's really the only time I that I got on Fridays. OK, then email me. Email okay. me and we'll, we'll set up an appointment. All righty then. Thank you. You're welcome. And everybody else who's here, see how easy that is? It is so easy to contact me. Okay, well, other than that, are there math questions now? I don't have any. Okay. All right, well then, I am going to stop recording. <laughs>